Brainchips 4C has been released with revenue declining by 81%. We know that BRN has commenced commercialization, and so I've seen a few questions about what's happening with Brainchip. We know that investors and analysts view retracements in revenue with some uncertainty, particularly for a company so early in its growth cycle. So today we're going to unpack BRN's 4C. We'll talk about the semiconductor sales cycle and revenue cycle, and then talk about the current state of play for Brainchip. But before we unpack the 4C, the numbers, and everything that's been going on in the story, let's have a bit of a refresher of who is Brainchip. So Brainchip have developed their neuromorphic technology called Akita. As we know, Akita leverages spiking neural networks to facilitate AI and processing at the edge. Now, AI itself is not new. I'm sure we're all familiar with the term AI, artificial intelligence. It's proliferating its way through the world around us, particularly as digitization picks up pace. But it's traditionally done leveraging convolutional neural networks, or CNNs. Data is collected at the edge if we're talking about Internet of Things technology, and then processing is done in the cloud. However, Brainchip's a key to technology that they've developed provides a range of different benefits versus the current incumbent forms of processing. Akita offers lower power consumption, greater efficiency and performance. It offers on-chip learning, but it also facilitates processing on device at the edge and ultimately reduces reliance on the cloud and the data alliance. Brainchip believe that they have developed a better solution, but not only is it trying to roll out its new technology, but it's also trying to drive an industry shift. It's ultimately making a market. And so Brainchip is trying to be a pioneer within this industry and bringing what they've termed as the world's first commercially available neuromorphic processor to market. But you might be wondering, why haven't we seen this change if it's such a revolution? And there are a number of different reasons why. Ultimately, the current technologies, the products, they already have chips in them and obviously they're working because we look at the world around us and these products have chips within them. We know that not only in the semiconductor space, but for any innovative and disruptive technologies, a newer and better technology or mousetrap as it has been coined takes time to affect change and to see this rollout happen. You need first movers and early adopters and ultimately if successful with the rollout, then the adoption starts to pick up pace and you see that snowballing effect. But when you think about the processing, you have discussions, negotiations, qualification, testing, and then ultimately if successful through that process, integration. And that does take time. It's not as simple as taking out the old chip from all of the current technologies and then just replacing them with a new Akita chip and off you go. It takes time to educate the market. Obviously, it takes a concerted and focused sales and marketing effort. And this is the transition from a research and development organization through to the commercialization phase, which we've been discussing previously. Ultimately, it takes time. You're seeking a paradigm shift in how things are currently done. And then there's also the key discussion of the sales and revenue cycle and timing. And so when I was thinking about the commercialization phase, I was thinking we could distill it down to a few key components for ease of discussion, and then also compare it to a reference point as well, just to help to conceptualize that understanding. So when we're thinking about commercialization in the semiconductor space, now this is not exclusive to Brainchip, it's about the semiconductor space more broadly. You can really distill it down to, I guess, four key components. And of course, this is a very simplified discussion, but one, you look to develop the technology. This is the R&D phase. In the lab, this is where all the technology development goes in. Then two, you look to get working silicon and prepare this ready for commercial scale. Three, you qualify with customers and ultimately if that's successful, obviously look to sign commercial agreements. And then four, if successful through that process, you see your products ending up in the customer's end products and ultimately see commercialization at scale. And we actually see quite a similar process for resources. Of course, it's a little bit different. This is a bit of an atypical process to many of the other technology companies that you might see roll out, particularly on the ASX. And I think it's worth noting that this discussion today is not a discussion about whether Brainchip will or won't succeed. That's about execution, delivery, and ability to scale. As you guys know, I'm not a financial advisor. Nothing we discuss is financial advice. Hopefully it's an interesting discussion to be that starting spot for you to do your own research from. But there is a similar sales and revenue process for resources, though it's a little bit different, but maybe it might help us to wrap our head around how this could look. So in the resources space, one, you start off with the land holdings and the tenements. You get those and then two, you look to define a resource. From there, you look to develop out a process flow sheet, develop out your feasibility studies, and obviously concurrently at the same time, you're trying to qualify your product with potential customers and then sign off takes. And then if successful through that process, then you look for commercialization or as it's termed in the resources space production, and then you look to sell your product. And I think it's worth noting that in the resources space, it's a well understood process. 
No one expects revenue flowing through. And I'm sure that many people can think top of mind about many companies who are pre-production, pre-revenue in the resources space that might command a one, two, three, four billion dollar market cap. Because I think investors are still able to identify inherent value from a resource prior to revenues flowing through because it's a more familiar space. Of course, every investor and analyst will attribute different values to these companies and that's what makes a market. It's not to say what's right or wrong, but I think it's worth noting that just because it's a different sector doesn't mean that the processes and the cycles are all that different. And so then that brings us to a company like Brainchip and their revenue streams and how they're looking to make their money. So they've defined two primary revenue streams. It's evidently a B2B focused play, but they've outlined two revenue streams. One, volume sales of chips. And then two, their focus is also looking at an IP model of licensing, similar to a company like Arm Holdings, if you're familiar with them. Obviously, there's ancillary revenue streams as well, such as selling PCIe boards. But these fo other focuses are more to drive evaluation and the making of the market rather than being a real focused revenue driver. And so with that understanding, you might be thinking, okay, commercialization started. It's ready now. Where are the dollars? I think it's worth noting to think about our prior analogy that it's different to resources. In the resources space, once production starts, you then start to see production ramp up incrementally potentially, but you see a scale up. As you add capacity on, you start to see revenue flowing through. But the semiconductor space is a lot more lumpy in the initial stages because there's a different type of revenue focus. You initially sign a licensing agreement with a commercial agreement that's in a first and then you see a first initial lump fee for the rights to use the technology. And then you go through a productization process. There may be some smaller supporting engineering and in integration fees, but after the licensing, as you can imagine, in a technology space, it's not as if you look to roll out a new smartphone, you get a new technology and you can implement that and it's in the new iPhone or Samsung Galaxy three weeks later. Obviously, there's gonna be a product development process and that could be two, three, four years before you see your technology integrated in. Same with say an electric vehicle. It's not as if you would just sign an agreement with an electric vehicle car maker and then in four weeks later, you'd see your technology there. But once you see your technology within the product, that's when you start to see royalties. And that's the more long going, consistent, stable cash flows and revenue streams that flow through. However, they don't start immediately as the commercial agreements are signed. You start with a licensing, which is an initial lump fee, and then you go through productization and ultimately if successful, royalties will flow through in the years after that. And so it's worth noting a few considerations when discussing this space. Revenue is likely to be lumpy around agreements and deal flow until those more steady flows come through. It's also worth noting that royalties have the potential to be relatively high margin due to the low cost of delivery and also the low incremental cost to scale as well. But it's worth noting as well that real revenue comes once the products hit the market. It's not on the signing of the commercial agreements themselves. And continuing on from our resources analogy that we've been talking about. Imagine commercialization is like production. But it's like production starts, however, you don't get your real revenue until, if we're talking about the electric vehicle space, your lithium, nickel, cobalt or graphite finds its way into a lithium ion battery, but it's not actually until the electric vehicle is produced or sold where you start to see the revenue recognized. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated as well with the commercially sensitive space that's surrounded by NDAs as well. But Brainchip have stated that they believe that in the second half of the year, we could start to see an uptick in revenue before obviously that grows into 23, 24 and 2025. And so that then brings us to the 4C itself. As we can see here, looking at some of the numbers, negative 81% drop to $205,000. That's down from around US $1.1 million in the prior quarter a net cash outflow of around $5 million with the biggest component here we can see of spend on R&D, which makes sense for where the current company is sitting. You might be wondering, how has that happened? I guess there's a few different discussion points here. First and foremost, the easiest one, following on from our past discussion, Akita is not into products yet. We know that Brainchip have signed two licensing agreements with Renassus as well as mega chips. And so it's conceivable that over the next couple of years and potentially sooner than that, we could start to see products with Akita within them, but Akita is not into end users products yet. There was no new licensing agreement signed over the past quarter, which is another contributing factor to that. So it's likely that the makeup of this revenue stream was predominantly engineering support as well as board sales as well. It's also worth noting as well, those two licensing deals that we mentioned with Renassus and mega chips, those initial fees potentially did flow through in past quarters, but it's still to be seen how much revenue from those agreements is also yet to be realized as well, which could mean there could be more revenue to be realized in upcoming quarters as well. So that gives an explanation of the downdraft in this quarter in comparison on a quarter on quarter 
to the past quarter. As we know, at that more macro level, we see that the market is moving towards smarter devices at the edge, which obviously a technology like Brainship Sakita can help to facilitate. Obviously, more technologies will come to market moving forward. So it'll be fascinating to see how the composition of market share is made up in years to come. There's a $60 billion TAM by 2025, and this is growing at above a 10% CAGR. So it's not inconceivable to believe that we could see a $100 billion plus TAM for Edge AI in years to come. So really that helps to paint the backdrop of a rapidly growing sector and one that's obviously in need for new technologies to facilitate the changes that we're seeing, such as smarter devices at the edge and obviously lower power consumption. Ultimately, it is all about adoption. If you are interested in other discussions about the broader macroeconomic space, here's a video that you might enjoy. Now this video is not a discussion to say whether Brainship will or won't succeed. Of course, we'll have to watch to see how they execute moving forward. However, this was more of a discussion about the fact that their revenue profile and the trajectory they're on is not atypical of the complex semiconductor space. It is the conventional path. I'd love to know your thoughts, so drop in a comment below what you think about Brainship and where you think things head. As we know, Rome wasn't built in a day. It takes time. Akita Ballista. Thank you so much for joining us. For now, stay well and happy investing.